Well, hello, and welcome to Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I'm Scott Fisher, and I'm glad you've chosen to study with me today. We're continuing our study of the new heavens and new earth, and today we're going to continue looking at what the Apostle John had to say in Revelation regarding the new heavens and new earth. Our text is Revelation 21, verses 1 through 11, and we're going to read it again, the entire passage, verses 1 through 11, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up and begin to take apart these verses one by one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars... Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now, as we've seen in our previous lessons, the new heavens and new earth is speaking of the full realization of the new covenant, the messianic kingdom introduced by Jesus and consummated with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And we spoke of the linguistic tools of metaphor and hyperbole to utilize that are being utilized to portray the blessing realized by those who are of faith as the promised messianic kingdom comes into its full realization and metaphor and hyperbole to also uh, illustrate or be used to portray the the judgment the curse that comes on the apostates of Israel who had broken covenant and received in their present day, first century Israel, the judgment of God upon that nation for its covenant breaking throughout its entire history consummated with the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, there are many metaphoric analogies utilized in Scripture to compare and contrast the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, from Genesis through Revelation. Now, I've said this before, and I want to reemphasize it again today. The contrast between the Old and New Covenants and the transition from Old to New is a major theme of the entire Bible. Now, to get an idea of how this plays out in Scripture, I, I did a simple word search in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And it reveals the word new is used 176 times in 161 verses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I'm going to show this to you on what I use now. As a side note, I, I made the switch from using an actual physical Bible to a digital version over 10 years ago. And I use Logos software, which is really the most comprehensive Bible study tool available, period. I I highly recommend it. Now, here's a screenshot of the results of that search. Now, obviously, not every time the word new is used 
is a contrast being made between the Old and the New Covenant. But many times it is. So if you just search the Old Testament, there are 123 uses of the word new, and it's found in 117 different verses. And if you search the New Testament, there's 53 uses of the word new in 44 verses. Now, one thing becomes obvious as you begin to break this down. The percentage of the uses of the word new in reference to the new covenant obviously is higher in the New Testament than in the Old. But it's present throughout the scriptures. Let me give you an example. Let's just look at a couple of verses of what I'm talking about from the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, the Lord says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Now clearly, it's a reference to what is to come in their future. And in the very next chapter in Isaiah 43, verse 19, the Lord says, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now, this is a direct reference to the ministry of John the Baptist, the, the, the roadway in the wilderness. Now, do you think John the Baptist was actually building a roadway? Do you think Isaiah is talking about the literal construction of a physical road? No, it's metaphor. And, and the roadway was the preparation of the way for the coming of Jesus. It preceded John's ministry, John the Baptist's ministry, preceded the coming of Messiah, preceded the coming of the new covenant, the new thing. Now, perhaps the most explicit look forward to the new covenant that's to come is contrast in the old covenant, in contrast with the old covenant, is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and 32. Now look what he says. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now, can it be any clearer? Now, here's another example of some of the things that I do when I'm, I'm studying to, to prepare these messages. Number one, I'll do that word study that I mentioned. And, and what we find in that word study, we see the following phrases throughout the scriptures using the word new. And I'll put it in a list so you can track with me. There's new wine, new growth, new grain, new thing, new moon, new house, new wineskins, new garment, new song, new strength, new heavens, new earth, new grass, new heart, new spirit, new name, new covenant, new commandment, new teaching, new lump, New creation, new man, new self, new Jerusalem, the new and living way. And then the final use of the word new is Jesus' statement in Revelation 21, verse 5, Behold, I'm making all things new. Now, in Revelation 21, 6, the Lord says, Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Now, Jesus refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega. This, is, this phrase is only used in Revelation, and it's used three times. And I think significantly, the first time that it's used is in Revelation chapter 1 as 
Jesus is introducing himself to John and preparing him for the vision that he's going to see. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus is declaring himself to be God. And it lines up exactly with John's opening verse in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When he says he is the beginning and the end, we know from John chapter 1 verse 1, he existed in the beginning with God and as God, and in the new covenant, a covenant that has no end, Paul puts it this way in speaking of Jesus, the promised Messiah, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ things in the heavens and things on the earth. So when Jesus says he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, essentially he is saying that he is the all in all. Everything that is was created by him and for him. As Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is God. And that is the revelation of Jesus. Folks, that is the new covenant. That is the new heavens and new earth. Now we pick it back up in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, where it concludes with Jesus' statement that he will, quote, give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Now, this is a direct reference and a fulfillment of the messianic prophecy of Isaiah chapter 55. Now, I encourage you, read the whole chapter to get a gr good grasp on this, but for time's sake, I'm, I'm only going to read the first three verses. Isaiah chapter 55, beginning at verse 1. Ho, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and delight in what is good. Eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear. And come to me, listen, that you may live, and I will make, here we go, an everlasting covenant with you, according to the faithful mercy shown to David. So with Jesus tying Isaiah 55 directly into his statement in Revelation 21 regarding the new heavens and new earth, it's just one more proof that the new heavens and new earth is the new covenant, the messianic kingdom. Now, we're going to close out today's study right there. Join me here again next week as we continue our study right here in Revelation chapter 21 and what the scripture says of the new heavens and new earth and how it unfolds throughout the scriptures. Remember, we let scripture interpret scripture. I invite you to join me right here on Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I post a teaching four times each week, usually, most of the time, on Monday through Thursdays. And I'll post a link on Facebook and Twitter, and if you click the subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen, you'll be notified whenever I post a new video. Well, I hope you'll go out and make today a great day. Be safe, be blessed, have a great weekend, and I hope to see you right here again on Monday.